Please support Gospel Tangents by purchasing a transcript available at Amazon.com or our website gospeltangents.com shop. Proceeds will be used to create documentaries on Mormon history, science, and theology. We'd like to create some series and we really need some support to do that. Thanks again for listening. Joseph Smith built temples in Kirtland and Nauvoo. The LDS Church has more than a hundred temples in operation now worldwide in the LDS Church. I asked Jim Von Cannon, a counselor in the First Presidency of the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, if temples are a big part of their worship. Check out our conversation. Let's also talk a little bit about uh, temples. Um, okay. So temples are a big deal in the, in the LDS Church, um, we believe, and that's one of the revelations from the Nauvoo period, mm -hmm. um, is that a, a man and a, and a woman can be sealed not just for this life but, but in the world to come, mm -hmm. and that uh, you know, we believe that that's part of the, the entrance into the celestial kingdom. So uh, how, first of all, how do you feel about, about that idea, about sealing for time and eternity? And well, I'll stop there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll follow up though. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. Please do. Uh, so, no, we don't. We don't subscribe to the idea of being sealed for all time and eternity. We we point back to uh, the New Testament and where the Lord is talking about. You know, there is neither giving nor taking in marriage in heaven, and that we don't believe that that's actually what's going to happen in, in in heaven. That we believe that that's you know, we'll probably know each other, uh, but that's not what's going to actually occur there. Now, that being said, when you factor in how we believe about what the kingdom is, we don't believe in, you know, just heaven and hell. We believe in Zion, a literal city where people are living in the forms, the perfect forms of, of their bodies. Uh, would there be marriage there? We don't know. We don't have enough scriptures to tell us one way or the other uh, it, it to go any further than that. So I hope that helps you okay, get a flavor so, for where we're okay. at. So, uh, yeah, that's actually part of 132, so that doesn't surprise me that you'd subscribe to that. Um, as far as temples, um, you know, Joseph wanted to build a temple in, uh, in Independence. Mm -hmm, and, correct. Uh, is, that, is that something you'd like to do as well in your church? Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, we have a, a recent revelation that talks about uh, the beginning to prepare uh, for the for the building of the temple, but we haven't had a command to build the temple yet, but but to prepare for that. So no, we do believe in temples, absolutely. Okay, so I know the uh, the the RLDS Church Community of Christ. Um, I, I actually remember uh, going to the temple. I was so excited because you know in the, in the LDS Church no, you, you can go to the open house, but after that it's, it's hands off. And so I was really excited to, to go to the Independence Temple there. And even in Kirtland, you know, that's a, that's a temple that's open to the public. Um, would you anticipate that that would, that would be the case as well, that it would be kind of a meeting house or, you know, a special meeting house? Or, uh, as best I can, I can say, I mean, you know, I would think it would be very similar to how we treat Kirtland. You know, reverently, but it's still open. There's nothing in there that someone couldn't see. Okay, so I know um, baptism for the dead, that was something, I believe it was canonized in the RLDS church for a time, although then it was later moved to an appendix and actually has been decanonized. Yeah, so section 107 is what it is for us, and the yeah, 1970 conference, they put that in the appendix, yes. Oh, okay. So um, Joseph... I believe, said that the baptisms for the dead should be done in the temple. I know that before the Nauvoo Temple was completed, they did some in the Mississippi River. Is that something that, uh, that you guys would participate in in, in the Remnant Church? Uh, no. Um, so here's where we're at with, with uh, that revelation. Um, we don't deny that Joseph gave uh, what we call Section 107, which was talking about, you know, finishing the temple, you know, otherwise you'll be rejected with your dead. Um, I'm not sure which version that, or what section it is for you all. I but, don't know off the top of my head. Either. No, you don't either. Okay. <laughs> um, but um, the, uh, the way we look at that is, is that we see that there was only two places that it was given instruction that it could be done. One was in the Temple in Nauvoo, and the other was in Independence. And the other part of that was is that um, the other issue that we have with it is, is that 
we don't have any instruction from Joseph, you know, from the Lord through, through Joseph on that particular instance. So, for instance, like I was talking about uh, your section 20, which is our section 17, you know, the Lord was very specific in explaining how water baptism was to occur and what was to be said and so forth. We don't have anything like that. And so we find that kind of spurious that there wasn't any instruction given that, that we can point the reference to and so forth that that was to occur. So at this point, we're kind of, I don't want to say agnostic about it, but um, we tend to uh, just really say we're not sure where we go with, with baptism for the dead at this point. Because there's other things that, that, that I have researched personally about this, about it having to go through the man of God. So in other words, there needing to be revelation of, as to who would be baptized for the dead. And so it just seems like there's a number of things that we don't know. And so it ends up being more conjecture. And so we leave that alone. So one other thing that I just rem remembered I wanted to ask you. So um, in our church, we, we believe in a lay leadership. Now you mentioned you were an engineer. Mm -hmm. Now that's true. Um, bishops, stake presidents, um, on down, never, nobody gets paid. I think the bishops get a little yearly stipend of you know maybe $100 or something, not very much money. Sure. Our apostles actually do have uh, a stipend. There was a recent... Uh, case where it looks like they make, you know, 90000 I don't remember what the number was, but um, so they are full-time. Our, our, our first presidency is full-time and our apostles are full-time. I'm not sure about 70s. I believe they might be as well. The first quorum of 70, those, they're considered general authorities. They are full-time. The second through seventh quorums uh, have their own jobs, I believe. That's how it okay. works. So I was just curious, is that the, the case in your, your church as well? Uh, pretty much. Um, we, you know, we're a smaller church, obviously, so we don't have the funds to do that. But yes, we do have a remuneration for those that are under full-time for the church. Um, and uh, just a, a little side note, uh, all the quorums of 74 hours are considered uh, general authorities in our church. Okay. Um, and we use the term general officer, but same thing. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember, we've... The funny thing about our church, the, if you're in the first quorum of 70, um, you can serve until you're 70 or 72 years old. I can't remember. 70, ah, okay. um, in the second through sec seventh quorum of 70, you only serve for a period of five years. They're technically considered general authorities. Uh, they're considered area authorities. Ah, right. um, and some of them do get called from the second quorum to the first quorum or, or whatever. You know, seventh quorum to the first quorum, whatever. Um, and then they serve until, until they're 70. Yeah, it sounds very similar in the respect that um, the 70 in themselves uh, can act like an apostle, but that's in the absence of an apostle right. and also in the absence of the first presidency. So that's, that's how they get that. But it's like you say, it's regional. They're out somewhere in the mission field somewhere, and so they have that authority in that place. But obviously... If that there's one of the 12 there, or one of the presidency there, then that changes that dynamic. So. It just brought up another question. I know in the early days of the church, uh, there was a, a high council, and then there were stake high councils. Mm -hmm. Now, in the modern LDS church, we don't, the, the stake high council still exists, but the general authority high council, which was equal in authority to the quorum of 12, mm -hmm. um, after Brigham Young left Nauvoo, basically dissolved that high council. It doesn't exist anymore. Oh, wow. Okay. And so, um, and I believe a lot of the uh, RLDS members were members of the high council, the general high council. Um, when we read about that high council, in our minds, we're thinking of stake, but, but that, that's been a difference. So do you guys have a, a, a general authority high council or stake high councils or... We have a standing high council, which is a, would be a general high council okay. uh, for the whole entire church. Uh, and that is considered our highest court. And so uh, all the judicial matters of the highest, I mean, that's the last court of appeals, basically, at that point. And that's presided over by the first presidency. And then uh, we do have uh, stake high councils, but right now we don't have any stakes. We just have districts. Okay. And then branches. And branches so you know, can comprise um, a districts. And then we have actually congregations that, that go under stakes, which are very similar in nature. 
Okay, so in your district, would that be kind of like a stake? You'd have eight mm -hmm. or nine. It's just a smaller or version or of a stake. Okay, is really what it amounts. Okay, to. and would you, when your war, when your congregations get bigger, would you move into wards, or would you just still call them branches? Uh, right now, we, we when they get larger, um, we have called them congregations, um, and there, there seems to be a little bit of a. Uh, Orthography has never been one of the strong suits of the early part of the church, so uh, <laughs> it, it leads us a little bit of a problem because we tend to be more of a precise society. We like to really get down to the, the fine detail. Um, the answer to the question is, is uh, uh, when you're in a stake, there would be congregations. And so if it, if, if it grew to the point where it was large enough to be a stake, those branches then would be uh, considered congregations under a district, they would all be considered branches, or if they're an outlier, they're not either in a district or a stake, they're just a branch. Okay. And then we have something called a mission, which is meaning that uh, basically uh, there is uh, no priesthood member. In other words, we go by the uh, six members and one being a priesthood member, uh, being able to, ha to constitute a branch of the church. So our, a you deacon- You would call that a mission? Y we, no, we would actually call that a branch. Oh, okay. Yeah, but a, but a mission would be, uh, you don't have a priesthood member, you just have a group of people. Oh, so a really small branch, essentially. Yeah, but they're being ministered to, but they're just out there in the mission field. There's no uh, a organized branch there at that point. They're just a group. So they're maybe kind of a home church. A kind of a home church step thing, yeah, which it typically starts out at. Now, since you mentioned mission, I was going to stop there and kind of keep going here. Um, Missionaries are a big deal in in the LDS Church. Do you send young men out on young men and young women out on missions? We uh, since, so since our priesthood is a little different in comprising, you know how they you're going up through the graduations. We send young and old men out. Oh, okay. So uh, to to be out and to preach the gospel as missionaries. Um, as far as uh, young women, we really haven't sent any young women out as missionaries. But they're encouraged to do that in their local areas and where they're at and on social media and so forth. Okay. All right. Well, anything else uh, that we missed that I should talk about? I don't think so. I think if you wanted to sum up where we're, our main thrust is, and that's really to build the kingdom of Zion here on earth. That's, that's who we are and that's what we're about. And uh, everything that we do is to that end. All right. Well, do you have a website or anything for anybody who wants to know more about, about your church? Sure. Uh, our website is www.theremnantchurch.com. All right. Well, great. Well, Brother Van, Coon, Van Cannon, um, thank you for meeting with me. Thank you for spending so much time. And I uh, hope I didn't ask too many questions. No, it was fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks again for meeting here on Gospel Tangents. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Jim. I'd like to thank him and especially Morgan Wiggle for helping us arrange this conversation and learning more about the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. In our next conversation, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Hugo Perego. He's a world-class researcher on DNA science, and he, I'm excited that he came all the way from Italy to talk to us here at Gospel Tangents. In our next conversation, we'll do a little bit of a DNA 101 for non-scientists to learn more about basic DNA science. We'll also listen to a very strange story about twins from two different fathers. There is also a, a proven case of a woman that had twins from two different men. You know, all you have to do is just have, you know, be fertile and uh, having two mature eggs and uh, have sexual relation within uh, a very short amount of time oh, wow. with two different men, and one fertilized one egg, and the other one fertilized the other egg. Never heard of that before. It did happen. Wow. It did happen. Click here to subscribe, click here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some other videos that we've done here on YouTube. We hope you'll use this as a valuable resource to learn more about Mormon history.